Thank you. I always worry a little bit about an introduction like that. Promising that he's an excellent teacher and you'll have a lot of fun. Well, <laughs> better if he says he's not really that good and then you can exceed, and then I can exceed the expectations. Uh, it is great to be back here in Berlin. Uh, I, unfortunately, because of a family a wedding, actually, as it turned out, had to miss the conference last year. But I've been, I've been here mo more years than not. Uh, it's a bit of a long trip across the Atlantic in the middle of the fall semester, but, uh, but it's, it's great to be uh, back here at the conference. It's one of the most interesting places to be uh, if you're interested in, de in Keynesian demand-led economics, and that's what I'll be talking a lot about today as we go forward. And it's great to, to see uh, a few of my old friends here who are loyal showing up for this lecture, as well as, uh, as, well as many of you who I haven't had the chance to meet, but we'll be looking forward to, to sharing some of these ideas. Uh, so the topic was roughly assigned to me, but certainly one that's close to my heart and I think becoming more and more important as time goes on is to link inequality and aggregate demand and then aggregate demand to broader economic activity. Uh, so I will just jump right in and talk about three dimensions of the context for the discussion, and then we'll get into some details. So the first one is pretty obvious, which is rising inequality. So there's been a striking increase in inequality. Uh, I'll focus what I know best, which is the United States situation, uh, but it's, I think it's true generally across the world in different degrees, but it's especially true in the US. Uh, and it follows at a period of approximate stability. So here's just a little bit of data uh, showing the share of the top 5%, the income share of the top 5% in the United States. Uh, you can do this at various different, different levels. Uh, because of the, the nature of the research I'll be talking about a bit later, I tend to focus on the top 5% and the bottom 95%. But as you can see, is the, is the cursor work here? I guess it doesn't. Uh, but I'll you know, describe it is that uh, showing from 1960 up until about 1980 or, or a little bit later, almost, almost flat, virtually no change. Uh, so a uh, lot of inequality, uh, the top 5% gets about 21% of the income, but, but it basically constant. And then starting in, say, 1982, uh, a major shift, uh, just a pretty much, there's a, little, a few j uh, jumps and, and valleys there, but, but over, you know, five-year horizon, a, uh, a, a monotonic upward trend to the point where now, actually, the, this is a, the, the data here a bit, are a bit old. I believe that's 2016, the last observation. But at 37 percent, 37 percent of uh, of income to the top five percent, so it's an increase of 16 percentage points uh, over about a quarter century, maybe a little more than that, and uh, which is obviously is dramatic. That's a huge difference. This is uh, these numbers have to add to one. <laughs> Uh, so you've had a, a massive shift uh, in this direction, and although I haven't updated this particular chart, I just saw some news that, that the newer data are, are showing this is continuing to rise, so it, it, keep, it keeps going up. Uh, also, uh, an another point to, to emphasize is that th that happens to be the top 5%. In fact, I, I looked at these data a little bit recently. I think this is 2018 data I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here. So the top, if you look at the top 10%, the top decile, it, obviously, its share has gone up, but all of that is in the top 5%. The entire increase uh, is, in other words, whether you look at the top 10% or the top 5%, you get that same, the same increase. If you look at the top 1%, you get 85% of the increase. If you look at the top one-tenth of 1%, you get 50, half, half of the increase in the top decile is concentrated in, in one one-hundredth <laughs> of that group, and they're very, very rich. So there's this, in general, kind of fanning out, in a sense, that, that, that is at the very top, it's growing faster and, 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 and as you go up. So you, know, you can think of the top you know, the quintile or decile is, is pretty high in the income distribution, uh, but the, the increases really are at the, at the very, very top. So that's the first, kind of the first context that I, that I wanna, wanna bring here. The second one is what I share with most of you, what most of these discussions will be here at the, at the conference, which is a Keynesian perspective, but I'm going to add my own, my own modifier, intrinsic Keynesian perspective. And, and uh, I, I've tried to define different kinds of thought or different perspective schools of thought in Keynesian macroeconomics through my entire teaching career. And I've had various different, different uh, words I've used. It was sometimes the radical Keynesian, sometimes the fundamental Keynesian. But I've focused, for the, at least in recent years, on, on this term intrinsic Keynesian. Intrinsic in English means by its very nature. So it, that demand is the engine of the economy by the very nature of market production. Uh, it's not the result of some kind of imperfection, say like a, a sticky wage or something like that. It was just the very nature of, 
uh, a really decentralized market production, capitalism in particular. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about this intrinsic Keynesian perspective. Uh, I, I don't have time to develop all the ideas here as I would in a full course, but you start with the failure of Say's Law, the basic uh, flawed logic of the loanable funds market. Uh, I, I think the chapter 14 of the general theory is one of the most interesting chapters. I wish it was a little clearer and I wish it came a little earlier in the book, but it explains why the so-called classical theory of interest uh, that ultimately generates Say's Law in a monetary economy fails, um, that the market interest rate will not somehow automatically close the gap in demands. Uh, and also the failure of wage and price adjustment. So these are two different pieces. One is basically a logical argument that interest rates don't, don't uh, assure uh, a sales law, don't assure enough demand to purchase full employment output. But then there's a second important thing, which I think is a little bit more subtle in some ways, is that wage and price adjustment is unlikely to restore the economy back to full employment. In some ways this is a little bit more radical, a little bit more outside the mainstream. Uh, in, in many respects, where the textbook idea is that Keynesian economics applies in the short term when wages and prices are sticky, but once wages and prices fully adjust, we get back to some kind of full employment, classical su supply-driven output. Uh, Keynes argued against that, Minsky argued against that, some of my early research went in the other direction. Many, many of us at this conference have written about this topic. Uh, it is basically, uh, th there are all sorts of reasons to assume that if you have uh, a weak economy, a stagnant economy, and a recession that falling wages and prices make things worse, not better, in particular debt deflation kinds of channels. And there's also, just a, in a little different perspective, just look at the way central banks actually behave. Uh, that uh, it seems like across the world, what central bankers really, really want to do is avoid deflation. So I find this, I found this in my entire, whatever, 37 plus years since my PhD, really contradictory. You look at the textbooks and they say we get Keynesian economics because wages and prices don't fall quickly enough. And then we look at practice and the last thing that uh, central bankers want to do is let wages and prices fall. Sometimes, somehow practically they realize it doesn't solve the problem. Which leads me to the, to the last point on this slide, uh, which is I would argue the inadequacy of, mo of monetary policy. Uh, that yes, monetary policy can have effects on the real economy, but what has emerged, uh, I think, in the United States, but around the world, and is now, uh, at least before the Great Recession crisis, uh, very much part of, very much part of the, the thinking at, at uh, central banks is the idea that well, uh, monetary policy is really the key mechanism to uh, bring the economy back to full employment, and once we have wise monetary policy, basically we have a. A, a classical supply-driven economy. Uh, and again, I don't have time to develop this in detail, but I'm skeptical of that view. I think the evidence since the financial crisis shows that uh, monetary policy is, in fact, relatively weak at restoring the economy to full employment. Uh, if I just to, to touch a couple of, of, of thoughts about why, one is just too much confidence in interest elasticities, too much confidence in the idea that falling interest rates have an important stimulative effect on demand. Uh, of course, the zero lower bound problem, but but the zero lower bound problem being much more significant and fundamental, not some kind of uh, strange curiosity, but something that's actually likely to happen in economies, in modern economies, maybe much of the time. Uh, and also a sense that when monetary policy does work, when it is effective, in some respects I would argue in the United States that monetary policy was somewhat effective at, at uh, stimulating demand in the uh, decade, two decades prior to the Great Recession, but how did it work? It worked by basically creating financial fragility. It worked by encouraging people to borrow, ultimately unsustainably, so that you had a kind of short-run benefit but a long-run cost in a very Hyman-Minsky kind of sense. So uh, the argument here from this slide is that the, the, the that uh, that kind of the Keynesian idea or the idea that demand is the engine of the economy it goes beyond the short run. I believe actually that's my next slide. Demand beyond the short run. To understand the path of economies through time requires identifying demand dynamics. And this is true over any horizon. So it's not just about business cycles of a year or two, five, six quarters. It, you know, as you extend the period longer, if you look at, at say, eras like the run-up to the Great Recession, I would argue in the United States more than 20 years, if you look at the period following the Great Recession and the uh, inability of the economy to, con to, to jump back to its previous path and the sometimes called secular stagnation, now extending a decade or more, that, that these, these understanding these phenomena require understanding the dynamics of demand. Uh, and so, 
This is a, a difference, this is where this intrinsic perspective differs from a mainstream sticky wage, sticky wa uh, price version of Keynesian economics. But the, the last point here is that these demand effects as we move beyond the short run do require consideration of the supply side. And here I think we don't, we see in, the, in a lot of the heterodox Keynesian literature lots of interesting analyses of demand, but in some sense not enough analysis of supply. And I'll, I'll add some, I'll add some, uh, some discussion here. Uh, supply may not be the primary engine of macroeconomics, as I say here, but it is necessary. And I'm going to make an argument for demand leading supply, a kind of reverse of Say's law, which I think is a pretty interesting direction to go. So the third part of the, uh, the context here is, is actually more of an empirical or historical observation is what we call unconventional recent macro histories. So two critical events or trends that certainly were not anticipated by the mainstream, and again, I apologize for being a somewhat US focused here, although these things apply more broadly. The Great Recession was, you know, again, from the mainstream point of view, surprisingly severe. Some of us, probably some of us sitting in this room were we're talking about these things before it happened. I can tell you my personal story. I believe it was February of 2007 when I gave a talk to actually a university alumni group and I was talking about current e economic conditions, worried about rising household debt and said, you know, the next recession might be worse than you think. Uh, and uh, actually published an op-ed on that in the, uh, I believe it was uh, the fall of 2007. Uh, about the same time, just a little little total aside here, uh, virtually, at the, I mean, within week, several weeks, my, my op-ed was in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which is a nice local paper, but it doesn't get a lot of, a lot of attention. In the Wall Street Journal, national and international, uh, there was an op-ed saying, yeah, there's a lot of household debt, but it's really no problem. That was written by Robert Lucas, Nobel Prize laureate. I will tell you that I think mine did better. Uh, so uh, I, I'll pat myself on the back on that one. Uh, but for the broader sense, that, that you know, mainstream macroeconomics was saying we're in the great moderation, recessions are small, we know how to run monetary policy, don't worry. Uh, ben Bernanke in um, March of 2008, there's you know, lags in the way the data come out, so officially the Great Recession starts in December of 2007, but March of 2008 it still hadn't been declared that the U.S. economy was in recession. Bernanke said something along the lines of yes, yeah, the, the data are weak, the economy might actually be in a recession, but don't worry, by the fall, we'll have everything taken care of. Now, if you know the history, fall of 2008, they did not have everything taken care of. That was the worst period in, in the U.S. economy, uh, much of the world economy since the Great Depression. Uh, so this, this, the severity of the Great Recession you know, caught mainstream economics by surprise. It was unconventional. Uh, the second of my historical uh, uh, events I want to consider today is, is the so-called secular stagnation. That uh, eventually, just to keep this uh, quasi-historical narrative going, once you have the fall of 2008, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the U.S. economy more or less falling off the cliff for a few months, looking like the beginning of the, of the, of the 1930s, the Great Depression, uh, people recognized, in a broad sense, this is really a problem. It requires you know, an active response. But it's a, it's a deep recession, it should bounce back quickly because historically when we have deep recessions, they tend to come back quickly. Uh, the economy tends to come back quickly, but it did not. In fact, it didn't come back at all. Maybe I should hold off, I'll show you some data towards the end of my, my talk today along these lines uh, that, uh, that, that we have had a very stagnant recovery despite the news that accounts of the U.S. economy is somehow booming or our current president, whose name shall be unmentioned, uh, saying uh, that, uh, that it's the best economy ever. The U.S. economy actually is, is way below the growth path that it, that it, it was on uh, prior to the Great Recession. And this kind of stagnation is something that I think is, was, again, uh, largely unanticipated in the mainstream and something that is interesting to address. So the objective of this lecture, this is all broad introduction, but is to link these three contextual, contextual pieces. Here's a hypothesis. Rising inequality, context number one, explains critical aspects of these unconventional macro uh, outcomes, context number three, through that intrinsic Keynesian theoretical perspective, context number two. So what I want to do in the remaining time I have is to develop first some theoretical points broadly summarizing. I bet uh, uh, Professor Lavoie probably talked a lot about some of these things this morning. I'm not as much, nearly as an expert in these things as he is, but just to kind of link a couple of the key theoretical ideas together about inequality, demand growth from several different perspectives, and then we'll go on and talk a little bit about the evidence of how, uh, of how 
this perspective helps explain these, uh, these interesting macro developments of the last uh, few decades. So into it, theoretical links between inequality and demand. Um, I'm going to start from a place I don't usually start. Uh, my graduate school uh, companion, Robert Blecker, is here. So back in the day, Robert, <laughs> when we sat, we sat in lectures at Stanford, we heard about the Cambridge Equation and, and things along these lines. Uh, no, no, no PowerPoints, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, no PowerPoints. Uh, sometimes overhead projectors, maybe, right? Uh, so. Uh, you know, there's this link, this Cambridge UK link between uh, inequality and the functional, well, well, first off I should say tying inequality to the functional distribution of income. My perspective on inequality is more about the personal income distribution. However, uh, it's very tied to a lot of the research on the functional distribution, particularly the distrib distribution between profits and wages. So you, in some ways come from a classical Marxian perspective where capital accumulation is the engine of growth. It's not really a demand channel kind of argument, uh, but, but it's really you know, the pursuit of profit and, and, the, and the pursuit of growth. Something about Marx, chap, volume one, chapter 25, the general law of capitalist accumulation pops into my head. And the, the kind of broadly post-Keynesian, but in a Cambridge sense, group of economists, John Robinson, Nicky Caldor, uh, Luigi Passanetti, uh, we're talking it, kind of linking this, pulling these things together with, with Keynesian macroeconomics and say, well, you have saving investment, investment equals capital accumulation. So I have derived there a very simple version of the Cambridge equation, whereby the, the growth of the economy is the saving rate times some kind of profit rate. Uh, and uh, basically, profits drive saving and growth, uh, you know, maybe adjusted for saving out of wages. This is a simple case where the propensity to consume out of wages is one. Uh, it implies that growth is profit-led and that less equal economies, that is having higher levels of profit, which are going to be going to a smaller share of the population, would grow faster uh, because of greater capital accumulation. Um, well, what about demand in a sense? This leads to various issues, various problems in my view. So, yes, Keynesian equilibrium, saving equals investment. The Cambridge equation defines, in a sense, a Keynesian equilibrium growth path. But along with the Cambridge equation, very much like the Herod uh, perspective that I'll be talking about a bit more uh, in, a, in a few minutes, is that there's a basic instability problem. So suppose you start with saving equals investment, saving you know, times the profit rate equals the growth rate, and you're on some kind of a steady state path, but saving rises. So saving rises, according to this equation, here, the, the Cambridge equation should lead to an increase in the rate of growth for fairly obvious reasons because if saving rises and saving is going to equal to investment, investment has to rise. Investment is what generates growth, so growth has to be higher. But if saving rises and you look at the effect on demand, demand is actually falling. And when demand falls, accelerator stories and other kinds of multiplier kinds of effects suggest that the economy is not going to grow faster, it's going to grow more slowly. And so what you have is actual growth declines when the equilibrium rate of growth rises, uh, and you have this kind of knife edge problem. And uh, I mentioned it in terms of the, the Cambridge equation, but it also applies to, uh, to Herod's famous article, which interestingly was kind of the foundation of my PhD dissertation in 1982. I'll have another comment about that in a bit. Uh, that this steady state, this kind of saving-driven steady state is not really a center of gravity, not an attracting point for the economy in this sense. So uh, I think in, in that context, th this, this perspective doesn't quite adequately link inequality, uh, rising uh, changes in wage profit share to, uh, to demand-driven uh, models in particular. The Koleskian model, the Koleskian growth model, which again I assume Professor Lavoie talked about in some detail this morning, is, uh, is better in this regard. I think it's more, ultimately more successful. So here I've derived a, about a simple Ecclesian model as, as can be done, I suppose, um, starting with a, a, a saving share, which depends on the saving out of profits. Um, the, uh, the, the, yeah, I should be more, what is that, pi u? That, shouldn't be a, that should not be a pi u. That's a mistake. I, apo I apologize. The final, the final part, this, this one is correct. So that's the... The saving out of profits times the profit share times the utilization rate, where the utilization rate is really uh, the, the, the ratio of output to capital. It's an index of, of the strength of the economy. So that's the saving equation. The investment equation, uh, this is where the uh, uh, applies the below, which has a, a, 
investment as a share of capital uh, means some constant term, a gamma zero, sometimes called animal spirits, plus a term that depends on capacity utilization, basically a, a um, uh, accelerator kind of effect, higher utilization, more investment. Uh, and then you equate saving and investment, you get the next equations, and you, you solve for the final equilibrium, which is really a, a kind of dynamic multiplier equation that this utilization rate, with the utilization rate being the key index for the overall uh, strength of the economy and output, is some autonomous demand component, the gamma zero in this case, the intercept of the investment function, times the multiplier, which is a saving rate minus something like an accelerator term that comes, comes through. So in this context, what you see is that that profit share in the denominator is, uh, you know, has the more, the more Keynesian interpretation. That is, if you have a higher profit share, there will be more saving, there will be less demand, and uh, the utilization rate would actually fall in this context. So this is uh, often called a wage-led economy, with the idea being that stronger when uh, profits are lower and wages are higher as a, share of, as a share of total income. More broadly, rising inequality that would increase the saving share, more money going to the top, more saving, uh, is going to slow economic activity. Okay, so what about, uh, before we move on here, let me comment a bit on, on the possibility of profit-led growth. Again, probably heard about these things, know about these things. So uh, I'm not going to derive uh, a lot of things. I don't want to get caught up in algebra and, and equations here too much. But uh, you know, basically the idea was to put profits in the investment function. So you see I've changed the investment function by adding an additional term where the gamma pi shows up uh, to add a profit rate or a profit share uh, into, into the investment function. And the, the logic, there's really, I think, two ways this is usually motivated. One is more the classical Marxian perspective in some sense, that, that, that profits are the objective of capital accumulation. So higher profits lead in some sense to a greater incentive to accumulate capital. A second one, one more closely tied to some of my own research over the years, is that profits provide a source of financing for investment. It's kind of a liquidity constraint argument where... Uh, where businesses invest more when they when they have when they have more money. Here's another little, a little bit of uh, an aside, personal historical aside. So uh, I was you know fortunate to get a nice nice uh, professorship a few years ago, and I had to give a little talk about you know to a general audience about about my research. I said, well, I've really had only two ideas in my entire life. One is that businesses. Uh, produce more when they sell more, and the other one is that businesses invest more when they have more money, and that explains it all. Uh, and it really, it really, it's, in some sense, it's true. It's very, very, uh, it's very, very intuitive. Um, okay, but so what? What is the result of this change in specification? Is that we get an ambiguous effect of profits uh, and inequality uh, because. Uh, higher profits have two different, uh, you know, in some ways competing directions. One is that the higher profits lead to higher saving, which reduces demand. As you distribute more, uh, more income to the higher income people, it's probably really more about personal income in some ways than it is about functional income. Uh, but the other is stimulative. Higher profits lead to higher investment, which stimulates demand. And so you have this kind of trade-off, and it could go either way in some ways. And so we have... Uh, the question of is growth profit-led or is growth wage-led. Um, and if, in particular, the profit-led uh, result comes out, it, that, that higher inequality actually might stimulate aggregate demand, which, as I put up here, and I don't know if all my more senior colleagues in the room would agree with me, but I feel it's a bit of an uncomfortable result uh, that, you know, when you put the various perspectives of, of, uh, of Keynesian, intrinsic Keynesian, post-Keynesian, kinds of thinking together. Most of us are in favor of a more egalitarian economy. I would certainly put myself there uh, and would like to see that you know, tied together to a, uh, you know, a stronger economy, higher employment, uh, things along these lines. So the, the, in hearing discussions about theoretical and empirical research on wage-led versus profit-led growth, I can at least say for myself that, that there's this, sometimes this tension uh, where Basically, uh, people you know, would like the world to be wage-led, but can't quite be sure that that's true. Uh, so uh, it, it's a kind of interesting perspective. I'll just largely leave it at that point. I know there will be other presentations here at the conference about this issue. Uh, I, I do want to do something. So I'll, this is linked to more my, own, my more recent research in this area. And be, have a bit of a critique of the profit-led growth idea, in part because I am somewhat uncomfortable with this, and also because I've thought a lot about investment over, over the years. So. Why would you have profit in the investment function? Um, 
So I think there's some problematic implications of a, of a truly independent role for a profit variable in investment given capital utilization. Uh, in particular, I would argue the pursuit of profit means avoiding excess capacity and being, uh, basically being able to meet demand when, it, when you have positive demand movement. So it makes entirely good sense to me to think about uh, targeting uh, the capital stock or the capacity of a firm to a level that is consistent with both you know, current sales and the possibility of sales being higher. So you might have some, some desired excess capacity in case there's an expansion of demand and you, want to, you can't move immediately to increase capacity. It all makes sense. But, but given that, why would there be an independent effect of profits? So uh, in particular, if you go back to the simple well, that's, that's right there. The simple linear equation saying it just says, well, for a given rate of utilization, if the profit rate goes up, you would invest more. What that really implies in some ways to me is, is this kind of liquidity constraint argument uh, that, uh, that it, just in terms of the general pursuit of profits, there would no be particular reason to add costly capacity just because profits are higher unless you were constrained to have a capacity lower than you'd actually desire and the, and the additional profits generate more liquidity. So... Let me comment on that middle, middle of the way down the slide. What liquidity cons, uh, constraints, profits provide internal finance. Again, uh, going into detail, I spent better part of 20 years of my career doing empirical work on this topic. It's close to my heart. I think it's entirely reasonable for things like startup activities, for venture capital, for you know, new businesses that are, are looking to grow faster and, and are constrained by, by the financial system from doing so. This could possibly be quite important for technical change, research and development, especially in new innovative firms. But in the aggregate, if we're talking about aggregate growth and aggregate demand, I would argue that investment, especially these days, is likely not much constrained by cash flow. This is maybe a little bit, again, a bit of a U.S. perspective. But right now, you look at the U.S. corporate se sector is flush with cash. In fact, one of, the, uh, one of the paradoxes of the whole tax cut, for those of you who paid any attention to these kinds of things, that the, the 27, well, 2017, it was passed, 28, it went into effect in 2018, the tax cut by the Trump administration. The idea was we're going to cut corporate taxes and we're going to change the international rules so that, that U.S. firms will repatriate their profits, and we're going to see this boom in investment. We have not seen a boom in investment. Uh, their uh, investment, if anything, has been, you know, there was a little bit of a sometimes called the sugar high from, the, from some of the stimulus in the, in the original tax cut, not so much on investment, maybe more on consumption. And then um, now investment is actually getting weaker. Uh, so that, that if you look at the aggregate, uh, there, this liquidity constraint argument, I think, is relatively weak. Uh, again, my colleague and friend uh, Robert Blecker is here, and he, you know, he could certainly comment on this much more than I do, but I think that if you are looking more at small open economies, and many of you are coming from, uh, from economies for which this would be the relevant context, uh, profit-led growth is more likely. Uh, that you have lower wage rates in that context, improving the uh, terms of trade for exports, which is a much bigger part of the economy than certainly in the United States and many other developed uh, economies, and also higher share of consumption that's imported. So as a result, the, the domestic uh, effect on domestic consumption is, is smaller relative to the economy as a whole. So, um, so I, I, I don't want to suggest that that we should take profit-led growth off the table, but I believe there are reasons to to be a little bit skeptical about the simple uh, investment function you see here, which just adds a, a linear term and in, in, in some kind of profit uh, ratio uh, to, the, uh, to the equation and have to think a little more detail what that means. Uh, so let me move to a little different perspective uh, on investment. And here I know I'm, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit away from inequality, but uh, I'll be assured that I'm going to come back. Uh, that uh, think about investment as instrumental, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So investment in some ways is not the goal of capitalism. So again, here you're moving away, I'm moving away from a more Marxian uh, classical perspective, but it's more of a means to an end. It's a, mean to, it's a means to target productive capacity consistent with sales. It's the instrument that businesses use to try to be able to make sure they can meet demand, which again, the demand is the engine, the intrinsic Keynesian perspective. So I have an investment equation there written down, which is my current investment equation uh, in, the, in the research I'm doing these days. And it's, you know, the first, uh, the first equality is basically a definition. <clears throat> Investment's the difference between next period's capital and this period's capital adjusted for depreciation. And then two terms, the, the target capital stock is a function of expected growth 
and a target capital output ratio. So why do you have the square term? Because I'm doing this in a kind of recursive way. So I have actual output, which is known at period T minus one. You're investing in period T to have a capital stock for period T plus one. So you have two periods of growth in there. That's not fundamentally important to the argument. And the V hat term is this desired capital output ratio. Uh, and it, uh, it captures a technical sense of the amount of capital you need to produce a unit of output and also this possibility of a desired excess capacity. Uh, kind of a target utilization rate could certainly be incorporated into this V, this v uh, coefficient. And one thing that's, that these models generate is basically investment that follows rather than leads macroeconomic activity. And this is a contrast with, you know, in some ways, my two great heroes historically, with Keynes and animal spirits, investment as the engine of the business cycle, and Minsky, who said that, you know, uh, Keynes had a uh, investment theory of output, and I have a financial theory of investment, and investment again would be, becomes the the driving force of the economy, and. Uh, this investment is instrumental is, is moving away from that to some extent uh, when we specify it that way. And, and I would argue I don't want to completely discount the, obviously the, the contributions of my, uh, of my, uh, of my heroes. Uh, I would argue there's a kind of historical specificity to this issue. And let me just do another quick empirical chart here. So this, uh, as usual, uh, data from the United States. Uh, and uh, th these are two different uh, investment, well, kind of investment data series, but in particular, I'll focus on, well, I'll focus on both of them. So the, it looks like green line to you. The green line on the top is, um, is business fixed investment. So this is uh, equipment and structures. Uh, I think it does it include intellectual property? Probably yes. Uh, now it probably does. In, um, in the United States, going back to, the, to uh, 1999, um, and uh, the bottom line is residential investment. And, and in particular, I would focus, I'm going to move away from the microphone. That might not be so, well, let me try this. Point over here that, uh, so this is the, this is the Great Recession. Uh, so here's the peak of residential construction. And it clearly leads by a lot the peak in business investment. Business investment was, was following, was following, okay, <laughs> was, was following the, uh, uh, the, the business cycle here. So there's a big drop in business investment with the worst downturn since the 1930s. But it was a, it was a follower, not a leader. Now, the earlier arrow is actually the 1990, uh, sorry, the 2000 recession. This is the bursting of the technology bubble. And here you see a different dynamic. Well, there, business investment was a leader. And it fell quite significantly, uh, whereas residential construction just kept kind of moving right along. In fact, consumption in general was quite strong. And as a result, that recession was very, was very mild. So the point here being that there is this historical specificity to this issue of the role of investment. Uh, it's, it's in the middle. It's neither you know, investment is driving everything, nor is it investment is always following. It's something in the middle in this context. OK, so uh, moving forward. Um, Talking, starting to get back a little bit to the idea here. So th these are now moving into the models I personally find most attractive these days. So, uh, so what about the Herod growth model, which I mentioned earlier, and linking it back to inequality? So uh, this instrumental investment function that I showed you earlier was something I actually uh, was developing for my PhD dissertation now uh, an embarrassingly long time ago, if we round closer to 40 years than 30. Uh, and. Uh, uh, managed to publish a paper out of it. That was nice. Journal of Post Keynesian Economics, 1984, um, and uh, the uh, the paper basically made this argument that there's a a unique steady state growth rate, what Herod called the warranted rate, G star, which implies the expectations in that investment function would be realized that if if the expected growth rate is equal to the warranted rate, that means actual growth will lead to expected, will equal the expectation, expectations will be realized, a sense of steady state, and, uh, uh, and, and things continue. Uh, but the warranted growth path was unstable, uh, and uh, that made it not terribly interesting for analyzing real world economic outcomes, uh, something I recognized in my PhD dissertation and in that, in that article. Uh, but the, you know, the, the underlying, if you like, micro foundations, which were very simplistic, just that mostly that investment function and a simple consumption function, seemed to me to be quite compelling. And I wasn't really ready to fully give up on this just because we got these unstable results. And so uh, I never forgot that question, although as you can tell from the dates on the slide, it took me a while. 
So between 1984 and 2013, I was doing mostly other things. Uh, but came back to it, and at that time uh, said, what could, what could contain these unstable Herodian dynamics? And the, on the upper bound at the top, uh, the, uh, the ceiling, in a sense, was supply and the constraints of resources. And then what was the you know, kind of helpful insight that really launched much of my recent research in this area was to realize that any level of autonomous demand would ultimately provide a floor on Herodian instability. Now, by autonomous demand here, I mean some kind of demand that is not directly tied to the state of the economy. So Herod's problem, in a way, is that consumption is a function of income, investment's a function, in some sense, of that, of that desired change in income, expected growth, and it all kind of you know, multiplies upon itself and either explode or collapse. If you put, interestingly, and this is the 2013 paper, any amount of autonomous demand, even a tiny amount, you know, kind of rigorously the, the math shows, you will eventually turn around the Herodian collapse. And if you have a supply constraint on top, you can contain the dynamics. And I thought initially that this would cause the system to bounce between effectively a floor, which would be autonomous demand times a multiplier term, and the supply constraint ceiling. And that's one possible outcome. Um, uh, and if that, if from that point of view, what would be the implication of rising inequality and a higher propensity to save? Well, it would lower it would lower that multiplier. So if you, I don't have a picture here, but if you could imagine the corridor in which the economy bounces, the bottom level would get lower with rising inequality, it would imply more volatile economy and larger business cycles, deeper recessions in some sense. However, now I can refer to another friend in the audience, Fabio Freitas is over here, among others, I'm sure, who are you know, champions of the super multiplier models. So, uh, uh, there's another possibility that was not immediately obvious to me uh, in, in working on that 2013 paper. It was by the time the paper was published, but in the work coming through, it, 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 it was recognized by the time the paper was published, but it wasn't emphasized from my point of view enough. That once you add autonomous demand to this basic Herod kind of dynamic, that you get the possibility of convergence to a steady state. Not only do you get a floor and ceiling, but the possibility that the fundamental dynamics become stable. And in this case, the steady state becomes reasonably a center of gravity with, a, with the steady state growth rate being driven by the growth rate of autonomous demand. And so it becomes more realistic to think about that steady state as at least having some influence on the actual path of an economy. And uh, so interestingly in my, you know, in my research career as I'm describing it, I, I rediscovered Herod in the early 1980s. I rediscovered Serrano about, uh, about uh, 2012 to 2014. So I'm rediscovering smart people. I don't feel too bad about that. Uh, it's uh, interesting to, to, to kind of go these directions in this sense. So in these super multiplier models, driven in the steady state growth rate driven by autonomous demand, what would be the channels for effects on inequality? Well. Uh, if you have rising inequality, you move towards a higher aggregate saving rate. Um, and what does that actually do? Well, interestingly, you know, the growth rate is driven by the growth rate of, of autonomous demand. So the higher saving doesn't have an effect on the steady state growth rate. It will, however, affect the level of the economy and move to a lower path. Uh, what you have is a downward trend of what effectively is that super multiplier. So that whatever autonomous demand you have gets magnified by a smaller amount, and you do have slower growth during this period of rising inequality. As you have a transition to a new steady state, you have slower growth. If you have steady rise in inequality, you'd have a steady downward trend in growth. So that would be a fairly obvious implication of these models. Uh, a somewhat more subtle implication, which I'll, um, I don't know if I'll talk about too much here. I'll talk a little bit about it here. I also have it into my, my Saturday morning presentation, is is how you could have um, inequality affecting the growth rate of autonomous demand itself. And this really depends on how you define autonomous demand, which is an interesting and important question that I don't think is fully resolved in this literature yet, but uh, not really the topic here. So I'll, again, if you're up at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, uh, <laughs> I will be talking some about that in the regular conference session. Okay, so an another set of channels here. Uh, and. Uh, let me, I think I'm getting close to the end of my theoretical discussion and we can look at some charts and some data and some history. Uh, but let me uh, emphasize here uh, also the possibility of demand leading supply. Remember in my context introduction 
He said, one of the issues is once you move beyond the short run, you can think about demand-led growth, but you can't ignore the supply side in many respects. So uh, I'm happy to say, just a week ago, I finally got, after a rather long and uh, somewhat tortuous referee process, acceptance of this paper at the Cambridge Journal. So it will be forthcoming someday with my co-authors, uh, Piero Ferri and Ana Maria Variato from Bergamo, Italy, uh, which I just came back from. Uh, so we, we've added some additional wrinkles to this model, which is that, of course, demand growth affects the unemployment rate. That's not a big surprise uh, in many respects, basic Keynesian result. Um, but that we have the un unemployment, this state of the economy, affecting both labor force growth and productivity growth. So we have, uh, I, I like to quote Amitabha Dutt on this, on this one. He has a nice paper where he says, makes a similar kind of argument and says, necessity is the mother of invention, using that little aphorism from English, the idea that you know, if an economy is operating at a high level, a high pressure economy, that productivity is going to grow faster in some sense. You'll draw more people into the labor force, uh, you know, possibly bring in more immigration. There's lots of different folks I could cite on this topic, uh, di different linkages between a, a relatively strong economy, in this case measured by a low unemployment rate, and faster growth of the supply side. What is very nice about this model is that when we put those those uh, uh, endogenous supply linkages into the model, we get a rather strong convergence of the supply of supply to the demand-led path. There is a, a clear reverse Say's law uh, in, in in this paper, and you know I'm, we're not the only one to talk about this thing, kind of thing, of course. But it's a nice simple way, nice simple way to get these things in there. So that super multiplier-driven demand path is pulling the supply side along with it in either direction, both up and down. Um, Again, and here I actually have to thank my referees who bugged me about this, that, and the other thing. And one, the final, one way to address it was to actually be a little bit more empirical in the paper. And so we added a, uh, a kind of empirical calibration of the model, to, uh, most, at least initially, to address some stability questions. But it led to some pretty interesting results, uh, which we've been not as, not as uh, careful about earlier, um, that there's a really re – the, 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 this – Empirically, the model, model generates a reasonable range of growth rates linked to a reasonable range of unemployment rates. So, you know, the basic theoretical result says, well, if, um, you know, if the economy goes stronger, it gro grows faster, uh, supply grows, uh, demand grows faster, supply grows faster, and, and in a sense accommodates demand. But if that required the unemployment rate to fall from, you know, 5% to minus 20%, it wouldn't be very interesting. In fact, it doesn't. In fact, uh, it's even less than one for one. But, uh, you know, as approximation, first approximation, you can say, take, take the U.S. economy, which might be growing around 2% now. If you were to have underlying autonomous demand growth accelerate to 3%, what you'd need is a one percentage point reduction in the unemployment rate. Uh, and that, there's some controversies in the U.S. about where the unemployment rate can go and whether that's really the right measure. But the point is it's quite reasonable. Large changes in the growth rate. Difference between a 2% and 3% growth in the economy is a big deal over the medium run. Uh, but so large changes in the growth rate can be accommodated, according to the data, by relatively small changes in the level of utilization of the labor force, which is really what the, the unemployment rate is measuring in this context. Um, so the argument here then is if rising inequality leads to stagnant demand, rising inequality also compromises the supply side or potential output of the economy. And so you get this, you know, this, this uh, again, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit to the empirical case of secular stagnation, but if you have a slow demand path, you pull the supply side down with it. And then a mainstream person looking at that says, well, gee, yeah, the economy is worse than it was, than we thought it would be 10 years ago, but nothing we can do about it because we're at potential output. Uh, that, but that's not true. <laughs> that actually, it was because of the, the, the weak demand, which, which certainly could have been addressed by institutional and policy changes, that it pulled supply down with it. Uh, and if you look at a situation like right now, you could say that despite the fact that it sees it as if the economy is operating roughly at potential output, that an acceleration of demand could pull supply and capacity and, and potential along with it upwards. In my view, this is a very compelling result. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a result that is kind of widely known in heterodox Keynesian economics. You know, people have been talking about this at conferences for my entire career in some sense. But I, I don't think it's gotten enough attention. It needs to get more. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm being a little bit too much of a salesperson here for the, for the paper. But uh, it's, a simple, it's a simple framework, and I think it, it generates really quite, quite important results. And whether it's this paper or other ones you'll see here or other, you know, somebody else's approach, that's less important to me. I think especially for the young folks in the audience, kind of taking this, 
supply-demand dance uh, into account in the way that they integrate with each other is, is a, a place where there, you could see really a fundamental change in the way we think about uh, macroeconomics in a, in a lot of sense. So anyway, uh, end of sales pitch uh, for this work, but I think it's important. So let me just summarize, then I'll move on to things more empirical in the second part of the lecture. So rising inequality and in aggregate demand, that's my, that's my topic. What does theory tell us? Uh, if there's a higher saving rate, we're going to get demand drag in, in Keynesian models. Uh, you know, you could have the, you know, the more classical approach. I didn't mention Caldor and a shift of income distribution and some of these other things, uh, you know, from the 1950s and 1960s. But I, I think uh, in general, if you look at more modern uh, Keynesian, post-Keynesian research on demand-led uh, economies, demand-led growth, in general, a higher saving rate is going to lead to a demand drag. Um, and higher saving rate is going to be linked with... with um, with, with rising inequality. I, I, I actually stuck this in here, this behavioral and progressive tax effects, because I wanted to put it someplace before I get to the empirical part. Uh, so it's a behavioral story in terms of if, you're, if more of the income is going to the top of the income distribution, that will be reducing consumption, increasing saving, reducing consumption, other things equal, the kind of behavioral idea that the rich generally spend a smaller share of their income. Uh, however, there's also progressive tax effects, which is more mechanical, but might actually be empirically more important, which is uh, that, that uh, high-income people do pay higher marginal tax rates. Uh, there's a recent data out by some people in the United States showing the super, super, super rich. I think it's the highest 400 earning people, uh, or maybe the 400 richest people in the United States actually pay a slightly lower tax rate than the people below them, which is pretty crazy, but, uh, but doesn't change the general idea that as income is distributed upward, you do see a higher share paid as taxes, so more leakages, and that may be at least as important as the higher share of saving. Um, okay, there is the possibility of profit-led investment. I am certainly not going to dismiss that as impossible, especially in develop, uh, uh, well in developing economies, smaller open economies, uh, but I, while I think it's possible, I, I personally think it's less likely, especially in large developed economies. Super multiplier models, you know, what I'm kind of into these days, higher saving rate lowers the multiplier in autonomous demand, so lowers the level of output along the growth path and certainly lowers growth along a transition, which can be quite long. Possible effects of inequality on the dynamics of autonomous demand, in particular household borrowing. I'll have a little more to say about that. So there are these various, these various uh, channels through which rising inequality affects aggregate demand. I think they're important. I think they generally go in the direction that a more progressive you know, ideological uh, point of view would suggest, higher inequality, weaker economy, even though there's the possibility of profit-led investment. So, uh, I, I mean, a lot of my work in this area has been more empirical and, his, and historical. So what I want to do is look at these two historical applications now in the roughly 40 minutes the lecture has to run. And um, uh, starting with the, uh, the origins of the Great Recession. What caused the conditions that led to the collapse in the Great Recession? So um, here, uh, I'll, let me talk a bit about household borrowing. Uh, basically fueling those demand generation dynamics. So to put this in, a, in, in, a, in the intrinsic Keynesian context, the basic intrinsic Keynesian message is it's demand dynamics that drive the economy, especially when you say demand leads supply, as, that, uh, as the new work suggests. So let's look at these demand dynamics. What was really the key dyna demand dynamic or one key demand dynamic of of the period leading up to the Great Recession in the U.S. Well, uh, in, in work with my former student, Barry Cinnamon, we, we called this period the consumer age. There's been some debate about whether that term is really right, and in retrospect, I might change that. But this consumer age uh, is a period of very high household borrowing, relatively strong household consumption. Um, clearly, lots of borrowing, whether consumption was strong or just kind of average, is, is, a, is, is somewhat of a debate. Um, but in particular, I would say consumption was strong in an era of rising inequality. Uh, so, um, so we did have here, actually this is the point I was saying, I didn't realize it was quite as evident in the, on this slide, but a kind of source of autonomous demand growth. In this context, it, it's easy to think in a lot of the papers, my own included, uh, will in the, in the context of the formal model, will we'll model autonomous demand as exogenous. But it doesn't have to be exogenous. Autonomous doesn't need to mean exogenous. In particular, I think the borrowing and spending of the household sector 
during this roughly 20 years before the, before the financial crisis really fits a Minsky theory of endogenous financial cycles of a situation where people are borrowing more, that, that greater borrowing stimulates the economy, it validates the more risky financial positions, it encourages even more borrowing and rising financial fragility until ultimately that breaks in a, in a crisis. So I just described Minsky in 15 seconds, keep mind, uh, in, in this context. And uh, I, I think it, in some ways it's, uh, it's the best example of a Minsky kind of cycle, better than his own historical examples in many respects uh, in terms of fitting the basic idea. Uh, but what's happening, so this is an endogenous economic process that we should interrogate closely and look, and look to see how, you know, how it's working and how it plays out. But, it, but it, in a way, it is creating a kind of demand dynamic that was not induced by the current state of the economy, that you have uh, a, a part of demand being, being generated by this drive towards borrowing, not because you simply have more income. So it makes it autonomous in that sense. Again, the terms may be not particularly precise, but I think if you look at the way these models work, you could think about this borrowing to spending dynamic as as captured by an autonomous demand type of uh, phenomenon in a super multiplier model. And in particular, it's, it, it offsets the, the drag from rising inequality. Part of the problem of making the case that the uh, dynamics leading up to the financial crisis are linked to rising inequality is that the timing doesn't seem to work. So I'll just give you a, a quick kind of paraphrase from a blog post of Paul Krugman, the, uh, left-leaning, strongly left-leaning by some people's me uh, measure, uh, American mainstream economist, uh, who is also a prominent columnist for the New York Times. So it, at some point, I don't know exactly when, uh, during the, in the aftermath of the financial crisis and the weak economy, Krugman said, well, there are people out there making the argument that because we have higher inequality, that's somehow responsible for the financial crisis. I'm sympathetic. I, I like the, I mean, I would, you know, ideologically I'm with you. I would like to see a more equal economy. But I'm a true scientist, and as a true scientist, I have to look at the actual data, and it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because inequality started rising in the early 1980s, Demand, household demand seemed pretty strong for you know, two decades. Now it, now it might be weaker, but the timing just doesn't work, and so he dismissed it immediately. But, but I think that we, he dismissed it too easily, that there's this interesting way in which the rising borrowing, that you know, maybe acceleration of demand financed by borrowing, not by income, was offsetting the drag from rising inequality. So yes, actually, if you look at consumption, it's, I think it's reasonably strong during this period of consumption growth, but it's not excessively strong. What's really excessive is the borrowing. In some sense, you could say that the demand drag you know, would have been pulling consumption down, but the borrowing kept it from being too bad. Uh, so, so let's take a look at some data. Here's uh, household debt to, uh, to income measures. Uh, the bottom line, the dotted line, the conventional measure, it peaks at about 130%. So this is debt divided by uh, after-tax disposable personal income. The top line is, I won't get, uh, dwell on this too much, but it comes from research, I, another paper I did with Barry Cinnamon, uh, where we adjusted uh, income measures to really count the cash flow that goes to the household sector. There's all sorts of strange things in income. Uh, I'll give you one simple example. So I own my house. So according to, according to uh, the national income statistics, I pay rent to myself. Uh, and that rent is literally counted as part of income in the national income sense. Uh, well, of course, I can't use the rent I pay to myself, which of course I don't do, uh, to, to service my debt. So it, the, the idea here is actually measure cash flows to the household sector. They are smaller substantially, especially in recent years. Now I have to give you another example. Another, another big reason for that is because of, of, medical, of medical costs. So the uh, uh, United States, as you know, has a kind of disastrous financing of health care system. Uh, but there is a substantial amount of government funding for health care. Medicare, which covers uh, uh, any American at o o above 65, or uh, Medicaid, the uh, large program to help provide um, health insurance to low-income people in the U.S., uh, both very, very large. It's th those, are, those are not government spending. That, uh, Medicaid and Medicare are treated as income. And so uh, when you get a conventional measure of income, that includes this government-paid uh, health care. And that's the biggest reason why you see the divergence of those curves. As, as medical costs have gotten higher, that income 
uh, has, has become bigger. But again, you can't use your Medicare payments to pay your mortgage. And so uh, if you're thinking about what's the right measure for um, a debt to income ratio, I would argue this. But you see, it doesn't really matter in a sense. You get the same story either way. I mean, it matters quantitatively. It's a pretty big difference. You know, the, this, our adjusted measure peaks at 170% rather than 130%. And you know the, the rise is faster, the decline is probably a bit larger uh, at, in the deleveraging period. But the point is the same, rising household financial fragility during this consumer age period, starting again from a period of relative stability in the 1960s and 1970s, and then starting roughly that same time as rising inequality in about uh, the early to mid-1980s. There is a, a buildup in, in the early years, which is my parents' generation buying houses in the World War II period, but, or the post-World War II period, but that stabilizes by the early 1960s and looked like ultimately it was sustainable but we saw, of course, that the, the big rises after that were, were ultimately not sustainable. This is from, similar, from that same research, uh, again, falling household saving rates, uh, these different adjusted measures. The top one is the official measure, um, which shows a clear downward trend in the saving rate from, uh, you know, again, about the late 1970s. It all started at the same time. Uh, our bottom one is what we call, what you might actually think of as saving more accurately. It's financial saving. In other words, this is actually putting money into financial assets rather than houses or you know, other kinds of interesting <laughs> things that show up in the national accounts. And once again, the drop is more significant to a substantially negative number. And you see the crisis there at the end. You see the big jump upward in these saving rates, especially in that bottom series, which is the you know, end of the consumer age, is the collapse of consumption and, and residential investment at the... Um, uh, as the crisis unfolds. So again, you have this rather paradoxical look here that when inequality was rising in the from you know middle 1980s that the saving rate was not going up as the more conventional models would suggest it was going down, but you have to link that together with the borrowing. I don't want to push this too hard, but in thinking about this lecture and looking at this and looking at this chart, I did notice the saving rate is basically, especially with our adjusted measure, not so much the official measure, with our adjusted measure, at least it's jumping back up to roughly the range it was uh, before the be kind of before the rise in inequality. There might be something interesting there, and unfortunately, these data are hard to get, and I need to get it to work. This is only uh, I think goes through maybe even only 2015. I think we can update to 2018 now and see what's happening. It would be interesting. In a little bit more direct link to um, inequality, look to see who was doing the borrowing. So this is from a chart that comes from our 2015 Cambridge paper with, um, with Barry, Barry Cinnamon. And uh, so this is the household debt to disposable income ratio. This, by the way, is conventional measure, not adjusted measure of disposable income. So this corresponds to an aggregate uh, debt to income ratio of, of 130% at the peak. And what you see here is the heavy uh, dark line on the top is the uh, bottom 95%, and the, the lower line, which is somewhat volatile but roughly, roughly constant, is the top 5%. Uh, so this comes from the Survey of Consumer Finances uh, every three years, although there was an extra supplement, I believe, in 2012 that shows up at the very end there. And uh, it's very clear that the debt... Uh, was rising for the lower part of the income distribution. This was not about the, the, the rich. Remember, when you look at that inequality, the top 5% really is where, it's at, where the action is. In fact, it might even be higher than that. You might say, well, what? why do we do bottom 95, top 5? Why not bottom half or bottom 80% or something like that? And they, there's actually a pretty simple answer, which is no matter which group we looked at, below the 95th percentile, the dynamic was almost the same. That is... There was nothing to be gained by, by further disaggregating that group. The bottom 20% might have been a little bit different, but there's, you know, they're very low-income people. So debt to income is you know, very volatile in that group. Uh, but aside from the, very, you know, from the very lowest part of the income distribution, you know, from the you know, really almost poor up to the very affluent at the 95th percentile, which these days in pre-tax income is running about a quarter million dollars a year, um, is... Um, the debt was rising. So it's important to recognize this was, this was not a phenomenon that was just about you know, low-income people or the poor, something like that. The, you know, the, up, the middle class and the upper middle class were, were borrowing quite heavily during this period. And given that you know, they had so much of the income, it was a big part of the dynamic. So 
So there is a kind of inequality aspect to this to this discussion, but it's you know it's uh, it's really about the very top versus everybody else uh, in, in this context. Here's another chart. Uh, that th this chart, by the way, is reasonably easy to get. That data source is fairly accessible and easy to work with. This chart is almost impossible to get. <laughs> this is uh, the uh, consumption rates. Uh, Focus primarily on the heavy lines: consumption rates and outlay rates. Outlays include interest, uh, but the think primarily about the consumption rates of the bottom 95 percent, the top line, and the in the, bo and the bottom 95 percent, the top line, and the top 5 percent, the bottom line. And, you know, the tops and bottoms get a little confusing here. And, 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 and look what, what's, what's happening in this context. The problem here is that there are just very poor data on consumption uh, that's microdata, disaggregated consumption data, at least in the U.S. Uh, it's, very, it's actually very disappointing. It's such an important you know, area for research, and, and we really need to have better data. But through various, uh, various links, uh, we were able to estimate this split of personal consumption between the 95 and 5 groups. And the results are interesting. When I first saw the, a chart, this chart, we revised it various times, but it had basically the same characteristics no matter how we did it. Uh, when I first saw the chart, I think Barry did the calculations. I said, we must have screwed it up. Uh, we must have made a mistake. Because I looked at this bottom, this bottom series, so that great volatility in there. There's all this jumping around of the rich. You know, what's going on here? But then, after some reflection, I realized that the answer lay in my macro textbooks from the 1970s, because at that time you had the life cycle hypothesis, the permanent income hypothesis. These were big parts of our education back in the day. You still probably hear about this, these things in graduate school. Uh, it's you know good neoclassical story about consumption smoothing. That is, if uh, marginal, declining marginal utility, you want to have, you want to equate marginal utility of consumption across periods, it means you want to smooth your consumption across period relative to your income. And guess what? The rich actually do it. Uh, the, what, what you're seeing there is recession, recession, really big recession. That's what those peaks are. And what happens is consumption relative to income jumps dramatically for the rich during those periods of time. Uh, however, for everybody else, you know, 19 out of 20 Americans, the bottom 95 percent, you get the opposite story. So it wasn't dramatic, but the fact that it's actually going down, that you're seeing the consumption income ratio fall in the Great Recession, means it's going exactly the opposite of consumption smoothing. That, you know, that they're able to, they're consuming a smaller share of their income when their incomes are falling in a recession. Why? Not direct evidence, but indirect. Uh, one reason is, is their borrowing was cut off. I mean, you go back here and say, and say it's that it's they were doing the borrowing. The borrowing was cut off. They could consume less, and as a result, we see this. And so that contra, you know, that I have the two arrows there: the bottom, the, the bottom 95 percent, and the top 5 percent, uh, you know, going in this direction, and giving an argument again that inequality and demand are related in a fundamental sense. Uh, and in particular, in this, in this period where you had the lower part of the income district, well, almost everyone borrowing more and uh, helping to stimulate their consumption, but that borrowing being cut off uh, only for the bottom 95 percent uh, when, um, when the crisis hits. So I want to go on to the second secular stagnation case, but uh, let me go to another issue that's been interesting and been discussed in this room. and other small rooms around this conference now for some time, which is more of a behavioral question uh, leading to some empirical work on whether the inequality directly encouraged the borrowing. I mean, broadly what I'm showing you is some correlations, that it was the lower part of the income distribution that borrowed more. It was the bottom 95 percent that were losing relative to everybody else in the income distribution. So I sometimes will say there's a, you know, it's a circumstantial case, but it's a strong one, that all these things are happening roughly at the same time linking inequality in these demand dynamics. But a more direct link would, would go this way, which is basically that the middle class responds to wage stagnation or slow relative growth compared to, to the top of the income distribution by borrowing more and increasing spending. And the question is, why would that happen? So you have this consumption cascade or emulation effects. I know Tel von Trick has worked on this. Uh, Mark Setterfield has worked on this. Uh, Yoon Kim, who's here I saw, you know, somewhere, or at least is on the program, has written some nice papers along these lines. Uh, and so this idea that 
consumption is driven in part by norms or, or reference groups, uh, and they, they tend to, uh, to look higher, they trend higher in the social structure, it's trend higher in the social structure, as I've suggested on the slide. So you have this, um, you have this, basically this incentive for people to look to people, you know, folks above them as a way of kind of driving their spending. And the idea of a cascade is not so much that somebody making median income in the United States these days would be about $60,000 in household income as the median, is not looking to people making 500000 to what they're doing. It's, they're not necessarily jumping that far. But the people, you know, making 200000 are looking at the ones making 500000 and the people making 150 are looking at 200 and the people making 95 are looking at those making 150 And you have this kind of cascading effect down the income distribution. So ultimately what's happening at the very top where you're having fast growth of income and fast growth of consumption is pulling up consumption in general across the entire distribution. In the first paper Barry Cinnamon and I wrote, we have a discursive... Uh, uh, section of the paper that talks about um, that talks about various social psychology and things along those lines that makes this case that there's a you know kind of a tendency to move in this direction. Um, another argument which is related, all these arguments are related, uh, go kind of the same direction, but it's, I think it takes on a little bit different perspective. Is one that in the end people want to spend more. Uh, it's probably an argument about impatience to some extent or more behavioral economics perspective that uh, people are more short-term oriented, think less about the long term. They're tempted to be spending more when they can spend more. But in some ways, the financial system in the old days, so to speak, so in the post-war decades, certainly into the 1960s and the 1970s, when I first remember making spending decisions, the financial system held you back. There wasn't really much, very much you could do. Uh, I think I got my first credit card when, you know, maybe the late 1970s, but the interest rates were really high and the credit limits were really quite low. Uh, home equity borrowing was something that, you know, was a late 80s innovation. Um, the financial system became, for a variety of reasons, I mean, this is another, another whole lecture, but uh, just became, just loosened the constraints on household spending. And as a result, people were pushing that, you know, pushing that bound out further in some sense. Uh, and, and that's a, another argument here. In particular, people whose wages were stagnating. You know, if, you're, if you basically had that sense that standard of living is supposed to be rising over time and you find stagnating wages, what can you do? Well, you can borrow more and, and try to keep your standards of living growing. Uh, the uncertainty argument also ties into this, a kind of safety and numbers argument, which was, you know, everybody's doing it type of argument. You know, if I go back to my parents' generation, you know, born in the 1930s, coming of age you know, uh, in World War II years or a little after, and, uh, you know, having especially their parents, my grandparents, being, uh, uh, you know, very, very frugal uh, in, in many ways, having survived trying to raise, uh, you know, young children during the Great Depression, but the movement into my generation, the baby boom generation, uh, you know, we're becoming less concerned about that. And everybody uh, around us is borrowing. Everybody has a home equity loan. Uh, everybody is, is using this idea. And so it's the sense of uncertainty leading people to say, let's do what other people are doing uh, in this context. And then an argument, which I don't have the name on here, but actually ties to someone you may have heard of, Elizabeth Warren, who these days is considered, according to the betting odds, the most likely person to face Donald Trump in the 2020 uh, presidential election. So Elizabeth Warren, and may or may not know, was a law, was, maybe still is, a law professor at Harvard. I guess she, maybe not, she's in the Senate. But, um, but she studied household finance. This was her thing. And she made the argument uh, back at least a decade ago, probably more like 15 or 20 years ago, that middle class life was becoming more expensive. That just to have what would be considered a normal middle class life, so it still ties to this idea of reference groups, but a normal middle class life was rising in cost. And there were a variety of reasons for this. One is because, uh, at least in the United States, the quality of the schools are determined by the, the neighborhood where you live in a very fundamental way. So there's a strong incentive you want to send your kids to good public schools that you need to buy a more expensive home in a higher income neighborhood. Um, that as we had a very uh, clear trend towards more households where both parents were working, that meant more market consumption, more, more cost of child care, um, you know, eating out, uh, taking care of the home, you know, contracting out things that used to be done more in the more, you know, 1950s traditional family where, 
one parent, the mother, would stay home and the father would go to work. Uh, as that changed, that made the cost of, of, uh, of, of raising a family or you know, just a middle class life rise. In fact, an interesting fact is you look at, if you look at median household income, it has risen, uh, not, not all that much, but some. But the increase is almost entirely about going from one worker to two worker households. So, uh, so this is a pretty strong argument. And then lastly, medical care, the increase in the cost of uh, medical care, both because its actual price is rising in relative terms and because the insurance was becoming less generous. So middle class households had to pay more for medical care. So it's not so much that people are just trying to live the lifestyle of the rich and famous. It is that they are actually they are actually just to maintain what they considered the normal life that they had gotten used to is becoming more and more expensive. And if their wages are stagnating, what are they going to do? They'll do what they can, which is they borrow. Um, so there are some questions. There's some debates. People have studied these things empirically. Some people are arguing that, you know, that there's uh, support for this kind of emulation, consumption cascade type of argument. Other people say the evidence is a little bit weak. Uh, I think some of them are represented here in the conference. Uh, we might see some discussion of these things. However, what we know for sure is that the American households borrowed a lot more and that they certainly, in my mind, that borrowing led to higher spending, no matter how you're, you know, look at it. They didn't, it wasn't just like they were bar borrowing to buy assets. Uh, they, they were borrowing to uh, uh, ultimately to, to have more spending, some of which was undoubtedly on bigger and better houses. Uh, but, but that, to my mind, is, you know, is part of the story. It's part of the consumption story, really, even though it might be officially called investment. So you know, here I note at the end, you know, this is my kind of case, one, one case study of intrinsic Keynesian dynamics. I mean, in a sense, when I talk about the intrinsic Keynesian model, what I have in mind is this kind of historical analysis, data analysis, it could be more formal econometrics, but to, I'm going to use this sociological verb, to interrogate the process that, that is leading to uh, the dynamics of demand, not just for a year or two. In this case, I'm talking about 20 plus years from the middle 1980s up till the eve of the Great Recession. So you get the idea. Okay. We've got about 15 minutes left. Let me do the, the second case. Robert, are you okay there? Hang in there, man. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it seemed like he wasn't quite up for another 15 minutes. Uh, but uh, feel free. Go get some coffee. <laughs> uh, let's, look at, uh, let's look at secular stagnation. Uh, clearly a related, a related issue, uh, which is we're talking about now the aftermath of the Great Recession, but a somewhat different dynamic. And I would argue you know, maybe even a more fundamental link to inequality. So let me just uh, make the case for stagnation in two charts. So, uh, well, a table and a chart. So, you know, you get this notion the U.S. economy is booming, the strongest economy in the world, best economy ever. That's a Donald Trump quote. Oh, I was going to mention his name, sorry. Uh, but uh, the, um, it, it's, really, it's really quite misleading. Yes, the unemployment rate is low. If you want to talk to me more about that, you know, find me during lunch or dinner or break, we'll, we'll have a conversation. Uh, the unemployment rate is low. It is really quite low historically. But virtually every other measure of macroeconomic uh, activity is weak. And so here is my personal easy way of, uh, of thinking about business cycles. So I like to compare peak to peak. So actually, I was just reminded that this is the old plucking model of Milton Friedman, the idea that somehow you know, the, the growth of the economy is on some kind of path that you plucked below it, you know, you know, you pull the string below this and, and you come back. So it's when you're at the peak that you're at least close, as close as you're going to get to some measure of potential output. It's not obvious to me you're actually at the really truly potential output, but you're, you're as close as you can get. So if you look at this peak to peak comparison, you get a sense of what, you know, how the capabilities of the economy are, emerge, are, are, are evolving over time. So I've done that going back to the 1970s. Uh, the middle column growth per year is the most interesting one where you see the first three cycles uh, all have roughly the same growth as a first approximation 2% per capita uh, in real terms. It slows non-trivially in that, in that cycle between the bursting of the technology bubble and uh, the bursting of the housing bubble to 1.5%. And in the current cycle, which is quite long, and again, they'll be pointed to record length cycle in some sense, it's, uh, you know, it's 0.9%. So it's half as much as it was in the earlier period. Now, fair enough, the current cycle is not over. The, the recession has not ended. Growth has generally been higher than that. In fact, when I first started doing this, this table, that number was 
and is edging its way up every quarter when you get a number that's one and a half or two or sometimes even three. It goes up. It just covered. It just jumped to point in rounding to 0 0.9 from 0 0.8. And, but it's going to take years before it even gets to 1.5. I mean, this is a long cycle. There's a lot of weight already there. In fact, you can see the, the first column, the total growth, the cumulative growth over this period, that it has, it's not had as much total growth in 46 quarters as the previous cycle, which is weak by historical standards, had in 30 quarters. So it's, you know, there's something happened. This is not the same kind of dynamic. This one to me is even more striking, but it takes a little bit more explanation. So the, the upper line here is, uh, is the output, official output gap as measured by uh, the, the Congressional Budget Office of the United States. So you see the, the Great Recession, it was quite deep, you're 6% below potential, and then you have this kind of slow, tortuous recovery back. But by 2017, by you know, fourth, uh, second quarter of 2017, the economy is now approximating potential output according to the official measures. What is the red line? Well, the CBO has to make a forecast 10 years ahead. Uh, it's part of the law. They do this for so you can analyze the effects of fiscal policies, uh, you know, so they forecast these things. So they make an estimate of potential output 10 years ahead. So in 2007, they were forecasting output in 2017. What happens if we compare what actually occurs now to what they were forecasting before the crisis? That's the red line. And it's dramatically different. I mean, first off, the recession itself leads to an almost 10% decline rather than a 6% decline. And it doesn't recover at all. It goes down. The growth rate is lower than they were projecting before the crisis. Now, one of the stories is, well, it's stagnant, and they look, at, they look at Robert and me. They look at the baby boomers and say, you guys are getting old. You're retiring. Uh, we, you, know, you were big generation, so that's going to – but these people knew that. They're very smart at what they do. They understood all the demographics and things along those lines. So this is a, this is a change in the forecast that, that's already demographically adjusted. So something happened. This is not – this is massive. Look at that. It's a 12 percent gap right now compared to what we said. So, well, it's kind of irrelevant. Who cares what they were forecasting 10 years ago? Well, but it's, you know, we should be able to explain this, what actually went on. So what I'm going to argue is the crisis changed the demand dynamics. What a surprise. In fact, I, I, I'm going to say, I don't know if I'm going to have time on Saturday, but in fact, I almost certainly won't. Uh, but I have a, a, a broader version of this talk which would say, Let's look at it. It could be a supply. It could be demand. Let me just say the supply story doesn't work. How do we know? There are a variety of reasons, but one is interest rates are lower and, and inflation is, is low. I mean, if you had a negative supply shock of 12 percent of GDP, any conventional model is going to predict, going to predict uh, inflationary uh, content and the interest rates are going to have to go up to choke off that demand, the excess demand. So the supply shock story, despite the fact that it fits people's kind of view of the world, is there. In fact, the supply – now I'm talking about it when I said I wouldn't – the, the people who want to make the supply story basically say, boy, something happened, we don't know what it was. Somehow productivity was just lower and, you know, boy, it's just too bad. Uh, and uh, and it, it becomes this great unknown in some sense. What productivity shock that we can't identify would be responsible for an aggregate 12 percent decline in, you know, the potential output of the economy? It's, to, me, to my mind, it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work at all. But the demand dynamic story, I think, is, quite, is ultimately quite effective. Uh, so we have what I've already talked about, the collapse in household borrowing leading to the historical contraction in household demand in the Great Recession crisis. We've talked about that. But then we have a remarkably stagnant recovery. Well, why? Because of the weak recovery of household demand. And I would argue here that we do have a central role for inequality. So a little bit of data. Uh, this is, again, our adjusted household demand measures using those same kinds of adjustment mechanisms we talked about. And you can see this goes back to 1990. You can see that basically household demand was rising along a pretty constant peak-to-peak -peak trend for, uh, I guess, here would be about 16 years. Uh, in fact, that trend is only calibrated to 2000 and 2006, but it happens to backcast back to 1990 really, really quite well. When recessions happen, the economy drops below the trend, but then recovers back to it uh, until now. You know, now you see the Great Recession, and you see how household demand fell dramatically and has never recovered. It has never recovered that trend. You say, well, the trend is becoming irrelevant. That's probably true. But we needed that demand. That the U.S. economy was not particularly booming in 2004, 2005, 2006. In fact, Alan Greenspan 
And maybe towards the end, Ben Bernanke get criticized for keeping interest rates too low because the economy was still kind of sluggish coming out of the 2001 recession during that period. This was not great. So whatever demand we had, the economy really needed to be approximately you know, mediocre. And we lost it, and we never got it back. And so you can, you can see the story here. Here's looking at a similar perspective, again, using these adjusted demand measures. So in this chart, I am calibrating, or I guess that's the right word, adjusting the uh, real household demand to 100 at the peak of every business cycle, and then letting it kind of play out until the next recession. And you, know, you can see that the story is pretty evident from the, from the chart. The heavy black line is the current cycle. Now this is, uh, I believe, what's yes, 2016. It's the last year we had in our adjusted series. So I, it's probably recovered back by now. It's probably back up above 100. But look how far below the history the, the current profile really is. It drops much more. And again, the recovery is much slower. So here's a little simple calculation, which interestingly, I was standing literally at the same podium talking about the work that led into this uh, a few years ago, giving a, a, one of the plenary talks at the, at the conference, where we took some of our work, we put in a simple kind of quantitative exercise. So that uh, M there is a, is a version of the super multiplier. I'm looking over at Fabio. It's not perfect. Uh, it, 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 in principle, it should have some import-export terms. It should have some investment terms. But they approximately cancel, in my view, for the US. So this is about as simple of a multiplier as you're going to get. It's 1 over 1 minus the propensity to consume. But the propensity to consume has got an income distribution aspect to it. So the lambdas there are the share of income between the two, uh, between a high group and a low group. For us, we did, not surprisingly, top 5 H, bottom 95 L. And you see the tax rates that are there too. And those are important in this context. And so we kind of calibrated that whole process out and, and, and estimated those things. And you see the bottom line on the slide is that, uh, is that the, the drop in this multiplier, so whatever the autonomous demand path is, the multiplier is you know, you know, taking it up to actual output, uh, it can explain about a 10% reduction in the growth path. Uh, would be a way of looking at this. And there are really two problems in this context. One is the loss of autonomous consumption uh, and actually the flat government spending, the negative demand shocks that took place in the context of the Great Recession. The other is that the multiplier itself is now lower due, due to uh, rising inequality. The first one, the loss of the, you know, the demand shocks were quite quick. I mean, that happened you know, over a few quarters and it was dramatically dropped. The, the, Rising inequality is a slow process, but in a sense, the idea here is that the economy is being dragged back to the demand path consistent with the higher inequality. That we were, in, in a way, I don't want to say artificial because that's really misleading, uh, but, but the borrowing, the unsustainable borrowing was keeping the demand path above what it would have been given the inequality. I mean, it's kind of a counterfactual story. And the empirical work could be much deeper in this area, but that seems to me quite plausible. And it does get, at least as a first cut, this kind of 10 plus percent effect on the demand path that we see in the secular stagnation. So, um, so here you see a, a, a you know, clear link between inequality and demand in that sense in saying this is really why, I mean, this picture is the easiest one, to a large extent you're seeing this gap open up. That, uh, you know, we're now in a world where we just have a, we, we aren't, the borrowing is not, is not uh, fixing the problem of inequality and demand as we go forward. Um, this is, I'm never quite sure exactly how to put this in, but I like this chart too much not to put it in the context. So this goes back to this 95.5 consumption thing, but it's a very simple calculation. What we did is just indexed uh, the top 5% and the bottom 95% to equal consumption in 1989, which is the beginning of that data set, and then just let it run. And you, know, you can see that the affluence becoming the growth engine of the US economy, that, uh, that to a large extent, it's the consumption of, of, the, of, the, of the top 5% and probably the top 1% that is really you know, where, where a lot of the growth comes from. You see, at least for the first what are six, seven years, they were pretty much the same. But then, and then, then you see the growth slowing among the, um, among the bottom 95% and then basically going flat. Uh, after that, and uh, whereas the the rich keep keep moving right along, so is demand linked? Uh, you know, demand and income distribution linked. The answer is yes. So um, I've got a big slide about policies here. I mean, big slide sounds a lot of stuff. Uh, you've heard about all these things: full employment, uh, infrastructure, middle class tax cuts, 
you know, universal basic income, employer of last resort, you know, things that are, are discussed all, all the way through there. In fact, from my point of view, the best policy is at the bottom, but it may be the hardest one, which is how do you get wage growth across the income distribution? Uh, you know, it, we had it in the United States in the post-war decades. It was, in many ways, the strongest macroeconomy, you know, macroeconomy maybe ever, uh, at least in the U.S. context, and, uh, and we lost it. And, you know, I think it's a, there's not a single reason. Uh, globalization comes to my mind right away, but you also have institutional changes, weaker labor unions, um, you know, generally the whole neoliberal policy environment is, is you know, relevant here. If Tom Pally, who's been here many years, were here, he's not here this year, but he'd be, he'd be talking about these things, and, and, and correctly so. And maybe there are ways to, to, to address, uh, address this going forward, is, you know, kind of changing this all along. But uh, my timer's clicking here. I've got four minutes and 35 seconds left. Uh, so some closing thoughts, starting with this idea of the intrinsic Keynesian model. That is the way to do, the way to understand macroeconomics is to understand demand dynamics. And, uh, you know, I, as, as you can somewhat see, I mean, I spent much of my, my career doing more formal econometrics and empirical work, and I'm all for it. I'm all for it, although I think a lot of this is more historical. I find that these methods of kind of looking at the data and building the narrative of the various different ways in which these, these different parts of the economy are interacting uh, is ultimately... Uh, Maybe ultimately more effective at understanding these de demand dynamics than uh, th than maybe you get from regressions. But whatever approach, but the idea is to study these demand dynamics and to study them beyond the short run. Um, here, I would argue that inequality is central to those di demand di dynamics, household demand especially. You know, I guess according to my measures, <laughs> measures I like, my adjusted measures, it's probably approaching three quarters of the U.S. Uh, of demand. Uh, the household demand part. So it's, you know, it's big. This is a shift from the Keynes-Minsky investment kind of emphasis as an engine of macro. Uh, I recognize that, but, you know, it's, I think we're in a different kind of era in this context. Talked about these examples, the seeds of the, re, uh, the Great Recession, 25-year process, basically. Uh, 1980, depends on where you want to start, but 1982 to 1987 would give you, exa or, sorry, 2007 would give you exactly 20, 25 years. So it's a first approximation, quarter-century process of this borrowing spending dynamic of demands, but rising financial fragility, a la Hyman Minsky, leading to the collapse. Secular stagnation, if I go back to at least the peak before the business cycle is 12 years and counting, I see nothing changing that in the short term. Uh, so good examples, in my view, of both broadly the intrinsic approach of studying demand dynamics to understand the economy and the topic of this lecture linking to inequality. Uh, the reverse says law. I want to emphasize that again. I'm going to leave my little repeat of my sales pitch that supply following demand, uh, that the economy's potential, its capability of producing, is related fundamentally to the dynamics of demand and income distribution. Uh, so, you know, I think this is a very rich research program. Uh, there's rising interest even in the mainstream on these things. They're recognizing more. I mean, Larry Summers comes to mind right away as someone who's who's now writing about maybe the post-Keynesians know something after all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I really mean both thank you very much from Larry Summers, but also I suppose I was supposed to leave time for questions, which I certainly did not do, and I apologize for that. It just occurred to me. Uh, but I'm, ha I'm around. I'm happy there. I should formally close the session because it's, it's been an hour and a half, and you've been very patient. Uh, but I would be happy to stay and answer questions. So let's consider it ended, uh, and then people want to hang around for questions and discussion, happy to do so. Thank you. So what I want to do, I, they're actually recording this, so maybe we should do it more formally. Does anybody want to start a question? No one has energy? <laughs> Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the contribution. Can I ask you, has there been an influence of quantitative easing and nearly zero interest rates on the distribution of income? Before you answer that question, let me just say, I haven't seen anything from the Federal Reserve System on this. Uh, I don't think there has been anything from the ECB, European Central Bank, but there has been some from the uh, Bank of England that, yes, there is an impact on redistribution of income. 
what is your so, opinion so in they, terms of in what terms you said? Of making it more equal? Sorry? Is it more equal because lower interest is... Yeah, they, yeah, it, yeah. it increases inequality, they say, yeah. because 40% of people who hold you know, these assets, government bonds, their price is going up. Right, right. We're on the 95% on top. But things may be different in America. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't know the direct answer. There are a couple of things, a couple of quick responses on that. One, one is, uh, you know, an interesting effect is this, which is lower interest rates, you know, higher bond prices, but also higher stock prices. So you see in general you have these higher wealth returns. But in talking to some financial people, one of the questions is people are seeing their, their, their statements on their, their brokerage accounts are seeing these higher asset prices. What they're not seeing, though, is that basically we're saying you have a lower rate of return. So that uh, they're going to be, in a way, disappointed if you think you can have a, I don't know, 15, 20 percent increase in your asset price, but, uh, but now instead of a, you know, whatever, 5 percent rate of return, you can expect a 3 percent rate of return. Uh, I think that's going to change, you know, potentially that's an interesting perspective. It might mean uh, that it's, it's harder to, um, uh, to actually see this. The other, the other thing is in terms of just income distribution directly and interest. It's an interesting phenomenon. I think if you look at the interest data themselves, you'd think lower interest rates would have, would have helped the borrower, which they did, but they were borrowing more. So I think those two things kind of canceled out. And so you don't see as big of an increase, say, in an interest ratio to income. Interest is a share of income. That does not increase as much as debt because of the falling increase. But I think that might have changed the U.S. situation a bit. Could I ask another question? If I don't know. Anybody else? Shall we? Yes, of course. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, other, my other point is that would you agree with my interpretation of the inequality just before the crisis? As you know, in the United States from 1933 until 1999, we had the Glass-Steagall Act, mm. which separated commercial investment banks. After 1999, President, uh, who, it was under Clinton. Clinton. Yes, he was persuaded by the financial sector to put them together, which happened in 1999. There was a repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act. As a result of that, and the removal of, of all restrictions on what the commercial banks and the investment banks were doing, like for example, um, not allowing. Uh, high int uh, higher rate of interest and all that, they were removed. There was enormous financial uh, f liberalization in the United States and elsewhere, but in the United States, the impact of that was that a lot of income now went to the top, 95%, but especially to the financial sector. And therefore, there was this enormous inequality and that, the inequality and the financial liberalization, produced the financial architecture, namely the creation or the, enf the enlargement of the parallel banking sector, borrowing from the commercial investment banks who had enormous liquidity now, and giving money just to anybody anybody who wanted a mortgage. That's why we have the subprime mortgage. But not only that, we had the, the creation of the collateralized debt obligations, which flooded Europe and the United Kingdom. And when we had the reversal of the rate of interest, we had a financial crisis. So, you know, there is this kind of explanation in terms of what inequality, how inequality can emerge and, you know, the impact of inequality in, uh, in the rest of the economy and producing financial crisis. And, and as we talk, there, is, there was an inversal of interest rates in March. In August, interest rates, long-term and short-term interest rates, more or less went back together. More recently, 15th of, of October, as I understand, there is a flattening of the 
uh, of, the, of the two relations in terms of the interest rates. And people expect if the Federal Reserve System reduces the rate of interest, things would go better. But if they don't, there will be a reversal of interest rates and therefore another financial crisis and you know, inequality as a result. Okay, so long question, quick answer. Uh, mostly to the first part, which is certainly the innovation in the financial system and the changes in the supply of finance, collateralized debt obligations, repeal of Glass-Steagall, change in other regulations, not just the 1999, but going back even to the late 1970s, critical, were critical to these dynamics. I tend to emphasize that less because I'm more focused on the household side, but somebody had to make those loans. In fact, when I first started this, I really thought the story was more from the household side. Now I'm almost thinking, if anything, it might be the supply side that opened the door and the households just flooded in. Uh, I think that's an interesting kind of interesting debate, but certainly necessary to this process. Um, and I, I don't know that the deregulation was fundamentally linked to inequality, but it's clear that rise, I mean, it's a good point that rising inequality you know, we talk, what, what are the structural features? I mentioned globalization and labor and market institutions, et cetera, and so forth. But a big part of the, of the increase at the top of the income distribution, especially that top one-tenth of one percent is financial, the financial industry. And so maybe these structural changes had a lot to do with that. So I think that's right. In terms of the, you know, the, the reversal of the, what do they call it, the yield curve, but it's not the yield curve. But anyway, the short-term rate being higher than the long-term rate. And the recession signal, it's been a, you know, that's an interesting question about monetary policy. You know, the, la the shift in monetary policy is actually quite striking. I will say this one thing. Now it's, my answer is getting longer than I thought, which is because it's consistent with what I was talking about before. That is, you know, you hear about the U.S. economy booming and 3.7% unemployment rate, best economy ever, all these kinds of things. And then you see the Federal Reserve lowering interest rates from what is already a very low standard. I mean, the, the, the Fed knows. <laughs> that this is stagnation. And it's really quite striking in my view. Uh, I thought that you know, basically the increases they started under Janet Yellen and continued when Powell took over was, was kind of conventional wisdom. So the fact that they're shifting is, I think, an implicit recognition of more of a secular stagnation on the demand side. What else would it be? So many more things one could say. Philip gave a nice lecture there. Uh, another question over here. Yes. I think we have one there. Oh, OK. One in the back, sorry. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Um, when you were explaining the effect of uh, profits on investment, uh, if I understood it correctly, you explained it as a cash constraint, but the way, uh, let's say, I've learned this was uh, a profitability incentive, rather. So um, can you clarify this point and which... Uh, effect do you think matters in, in this case? Thank you. No, I, I, the, thank you for the question. I think the, I, I did mention the two, those two channels. One is that more of a, you know, cl like I said, a classical you know, Cambridge, almost Marx kind of argument that profit is the motive of, of production and capital accumulation and growth. And so higher profits lead to more growth higher, and more capital accum accumulation. So higher profits lead to more investment. Um, and then the liquidity constraint argument. So those become the two, the two channels. The problem I have with the first one is, is, is uh, as I mentioned it, which is if you think about this as an independent effect from something like demand expectations or capacity utilization, then you're basically saying that you know, a business that is, has plenty of capacity to meet its demand but then sees an increase in profit will, for no other reason, raise their, raise their investment. And to me, that's not fully consistent with actually seeking profits because you know, you know, this, is, this is costly. So, uh, I mean, maybe there's room for debate on that issue, and I probably is. I mean, it's a pretty deep, deep question. But that's the reason I find that less compelling. The liquidity constraint story, I feel like, you know, again, I've done a lot of research on that topic myself, uh, that for certain kinds of firms, a more microeconomic argument, it is actually, it has been important, it continues to be important, but that in the aggregate, it, it's not clear it's so important, uh, that those firms tend to be smaller, startup kinds of things. So in terms of in the innovative part of the economy, you know, getting uh, money to, uh, 
uh, you know, venture capital or things like this could be quite important. Let me just give you a simple you know, a, a policy example, which is if you said to me, let's try to find ways to find better, better ways to finance innovation, to get more, uh, more cash in the hands of the most innovative sectors of the economy, you'd find me jumping on board. If you tell me, let's have a corporate tax cut that just you know, across the board just puts more money in the hands of the shareholders, uh, to many corporations that already have billions and billions of dollars of cash reserves, I don't see that as very effective. Yes, uh, Olivia Alain, um, Université oh, de Paris, uh, Centre d'économie de la Sorbonne. Thank you, Stephen, for your presentation. I, have, uh, I need a clarification. Uh, I, I understand that you, you support wedge-led regimes. And um, accordingly, if there is a rise in uh, inequality, uh, it results in a decline of the economic growth. But in the same time, you said that inequality uh, causes uh, a rise in household borrowing. And for instance, in Fabio's model, if uh, household borrowing increases, it supports consumption and then it supports um, the growth, uh, the, the, an increase in the rate of the economic growth. So does inequality uh, support the decline or the rise in the rate of economic growth? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, I mean, in my mind, so let me try to give you my view and then we might do a, do a follow up. In a sense, well, I don't want to say in steady state, that's too, that's, no, I shouldn't go there on this one. Um, there are maybe two different ways I could see having stronger economic growth. One is a truly wage-led regime. If I was going to give a historical example of that, I would think of the United States in the post-World War II decades where you have fast growth across the income distribution uh, and very strong consumption, but also at least stable, if not declining, inequality during that period of time. So, uh, so that would be, I think of as a strong demand environment. The second one would be what I sp talked in some detail about, which is that consumer age period prior to the Great Recession, where wages were relatively stagnant, but borrowing was very strong, so that uh, consumption managed to be pretty good. And so we were also supporting strong growth, but in a different kind of way. Now. Um, the first one, in some ways, is obviously related to inequality. The second one is more ambiguously related to inequality. So uh, at least some of the evidence I showed was that, that the borrowing was at least outside of the rich. So you can make the case that the borrowing was helping to keep, you know, was, was linked to the fact that there was rising inequality. And it is the case that the borrowing, the increase in debt, started at roughly the same time as the rising income inequality, so that the, you can see this borrowing is in some ways offsetting the effects of stagnant wage growth on standards of living. Um, a more direct effect would be that behavioral link, the consumption cascade or something along those lines. But both of those lead to a different kind of, uh, maybe a different character of growth, but both are, both are positive. The, the, the different, I guess the main difference is the first one is ultimately sustainable. I mean, there's no crisis there. It's, uh, it, it can continue, it seems like, indefinitely. The second one runs into Minsky problems, which is if you have, if you have too much borrowing, you build financial fragility, and ultimately that comes down. I'll leave it to the microphone people to make the choices. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not familiar with um, how is the Keynesian view on how is money being created? How is money being created? Okay, well, that's another lecture, isn't it? Uh, so basically endogenous money here, uh, which is that uh, in particular in these models, you know, where like, I mean, I, I didn't talk at all, say, about the financing and investment that takes place during these models. So the, implicitly, there's an endogenous money process being created, so that, which is important. I mean, there was the earlier question about liquidity constraints on businesses and things like this, that the, the basic story here is that there will be, the, the financial system will create what the, the money that is necessary or the financing that is necessary to, to support the level of investment that comes out of the model. If that is not true, you should have another, you, have, you need another structure in the model, one which is uh, 
one, one which, which models that constraint explicitly. Uh, and I think that, I mean, a lot of people have, have put together growth models, particularly in the more Koleskian tradition, with that kind of, that kind of thing there. I didn't, it's not part of my story here. Uh, but it, it is important. Hi, hi, Sam. Uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, if I may just go back to your question, I think um, the in the the wage-led demand a formula formula that you showed the savings is on the denominator. So therefore, when the savings increase, um, then growth goes down. And the idea is that if you have household debt, then this is like negative savings. So it would technically decrease the denominator, making the growth go up, which is, I think, the point more or less that was trying to be brought up, that it's kind of paradoxical that the same inequality is creating the household debt that is sustaining the uh, regime that you know, creates inequality, in a sense. So because we have a wage-led demand that therefore we should see lower, lower growth, but we don't necessarily because of household debt. Right. So, so. this is a good empirical question. I mean, I understand a little bit better what the, what, where, the, the sense of a contradiction. So in some ways, this is kind of the Krugman point, right? That, that basically, if the, if the wage-led story, the kind of Kales the, the, the straightforward Koleski and wage-led story is that is that higher inequality means higher saving, that should be bad for growth. We saw higher inequality, but we saw lower saving. I mean, this is the US experience from 1984, 85 until at least 2006. So it seems in a way contradictory. The response is that it's it's more complicated, right? That that there's there was this additional addition to household demand coming from borrowing. And so we didn't see the effects of the demand drag from rising inequality, the wage led, what you would expect from a wage led growth, until the secular stagnation, until after the crisis. When we lost the borrowing, then we see it. That is my story. I think it's a good story. I think the charts roughly support it, but there's an open question, which is, you know, let's, I mean, I, I, the research question as I would see it right now in the, in, the, in the light of these two comments would be to go back and look specifically at that borrowing, how large was it, what were the kinds of income distribution things going on, to really dig into this in some detail. I haven't done that. I mean, I know in general the debt to income ratio was rising. That means people are borrowing more than the growth of their income. But, but how large is that relative to the shifts in distribution? Remember that the shift in distribution is quite significant, but it's rather slow. So you go, that 30, or that 16 points I talked about goes from, whatever, 1983, 4, 5, up until 2016. <laughs> so it's year by year, it's not that much. It wouldn't take so much to offset it with this borrowing. But once we lose the borrowing, then we're there. So, you know, I, I think the, the argument is strong on the surface. It fits kind of the, the historical place, the historical, but, it, but it's not, you know, it, it, there's certainly room for much more detailed work in the area. Good question. Yes. Um, one thing is that, in fact, this question reveals the necessity of um, an analysis of the interaction between personal income distribution and functional income distribution uh, in real uh, situations, in historical terms. This is important to, to understand what is happening in, in some of the paradoxical, paradoxical eventually paradoxical results uh, related to wage led or uh, something like that. The other point, I believe, is that your extension of the, the research program towards the uh, supply side, the reaction of the supply side is very important because it allows us to, to give a um, uh, connection to economic policy and political economy in general. It's really important because in the next step, I believe, is start to, to think about uh, the reaction of, uh, try to, to have some hints on, in the model of the reaction parameters of the fiscal and monetary policies uh, 
to the rate of unemployment, to the situation of the laborers, and, 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 and things like that. It's the next frontier, exactly, considering this, and this goes back to the rate of growth of the economy. So it's really important because it completes the history in some sense, the connection between inflation, wages, and unemployment, and things like that. I believe it's the next point to be de developed. Yeah, thank you, Fabio, for that, that, uh, make that comment. In fact, I want to mention, now it's a smaller group here, but Fabio Freitas, Olivier Long, are two of the major innovators in the in this super multiplier world, which I'm a little bit of a late arriver to, but I'm going to be a strong supporter of this, uh, and and I I fully agree with this point. Again, I don't want to sound like I'm, if you use this again American term, hawking. It means hard sell, hawking my own paper, uh, in, in in some respects, but. In the broad sense, I actually have seen Olivier's title, I haven't seen your paper, but you're going to talk about some similar things, I believe, in terms of linking the natural rate of unemployment to, the, to, the, to these kinds of growth, growth uh, models that if we really have a solid linkage between demand-led growth and what's happening on the supply side, it really is a, it's a different kind of macroeconomics from what you see in the textbooks. I mean, always the post-Keynesian perspective has been different. It's always been about we need to pay attention to the demand side. The demand side is important. These things are being ignored more broadly in the mainstream. Uh, but once you bring the supply side together with it, it really changes it changes the world in my, in my respect. Uh, you know, I've seen a number of these papers which, which we, we'll start with a simple assumption saying, well, let's assume the labor supply is infinitely elastic. And then somebody will say something like, well, it's kind of like the way China is. Yes, right. But in developed economies, we know that these constraints were not that far away. I mean, I think the U.S. is pretty significantly below potential output, but not dramatically so. Uh, you, ha you have to kind of think about the way these things work together. And it, it, it lends a certain kind of plausibility to the discussion as well. If you walk into a policy discussion and say, we should just increase demand, for, well, the debt and, you know, this kind of thing, and we might have inflation and things along those lines. Uh, but if you, if you have a coherent way of saying there's going to be a coordinated linkage between the rise in demand and the rise in supply, and I can show you the empirical ways in which they tie together, you're, you're really on much more solid ground, it seems to me, in that conversation. So, I mean, this stuff is pretty new in my own thinking, but I, I'm excited about it I, in, many, in many respects. I had this, you know, there were, there were moments in my teaching for all these decades where, you know, I'd finish and I'd kind of go through the whole Keynesian story and wage and price adjustment doesn't solve the problem and monetary policy doesn't solve the problem. So what we really need to do is study demand and that's where we'd stop. And that, this, I think, takes that, takes that a, a step further. So thanks for letting me make another sales pitch uh, uh, for that kind of work. But pretty much, probably folks are, are, are I've had enough, and I, and I appreciate that. Uh, thanks again, and uh, you know, come by Saturday morning for more, uh, and I'll be around for the remainder of the conference. I'll be happy to talk with any of you.